I, I don't often have guests, and uh, this is not a program devoted to interviews in any shape or form, but you know, that sounded like a line right out of one of your works. The history of the Wild West from Tom X to Tom Arness. Uh, somehow it has that wild, surrealistic unreality. I don't remember having uh, actually done it, but it's quite possible I may have. <laughs> history. <laughs> Like the history of America, from Texas Guinan to Elsa Maxwell. Very sound idea. I'm sure that if you were sort of punched along right here, you probably could sell a good many copies. <laughs> I'm beginning to believe that you can, uh, you know, selling copies of almost anything, uh, it's a very strange story. When, in the 1920s, during the Dada, did you, did you have anything to do, or did you know the Dadaist movement at all? I know some of the people connected with it. Yes, there was a um, there was a French writer named Philippe Soupold who was the uh, usually uh, regarded as one of the three founders of it. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, I ran into him in France once, and uh, of course the first question he asked me was, uh, "What was it like to work for the Marx Brothers?" What is his name again? <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> thanks for uh, I was having a drink with Mr. Roma, and he was telling me some story or other about the, um, uh, uh, I think it, was, uh, it took place in, back in 1926 or 27. He said, I was in this uh, uh, small watering place in the south of France, he said, and uh, he said, staying at the hotel, and he said, uh, one afternoon, I was walking, strolling up and down the porch with my arm through that of Oppie, and I interrupted him. I said, Oppie, uh, and he said, yes, uh, E. Phillips Oppenheim. He said, and we were walking up, <laughs> and suddenly I stopped listening to what he was saying. The thought of Sax Roma with his arm entwined through E. Phillips Oppenheim <laughs> walking up and down this porch this isn't too much. I mean, <laughs> cosmic picture. Oh, well. <laughs> What do you want? <laughs> Talk about intrigue. <laughs> oh, imagine these two men. They could have blown the world apart <laughs> with a chance word. <laughs> That's true. A momentary peak, and we'd have all had it. We'd have had it. <laughs> well, here, here's a, here's a typical, um, uh, Dr. Dr. Kumanchu. Of course, we, we don't want to get into this. I mean, we could go on and on and on. Yeah, but if I was perplexed, doubt that my companion had become temporarily paralyzed. I heard the quick intake of his breath. I turned, and I saw him standing, a man rigid with amazement, positively glaring at the figure of the tall Chinese that stood over the emerald table. It was Dr. Fung Chu. Well, I mean, <laughs> it obviously wasn't Lou Holt, uh, <laughs> any one of a dozen different people. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's, it's a touch of pleasure to have you here, you know, that because... I, I, uh, I, you're one of those people. One of, I, I remember a line that um, J.D. Salinger, who uh, is not very humorous most of the time, but has a streak of it running through much of his work. Uh, Salinger in The Catcher in the Rye said, you know, he says, there, there are only a few guys that I've ever read that I wanted to meet. But immediately I wanted to, I wanted to see this guy and say something to him. And he, he made this comment, and I, I thought, yeah, that's true. There have only been about five or six people that I've ever read, that I've ever been involved in, that I would actually like to meet. And uh, here we are. So, um, I mean, and, and there's, there's none of this. I don't feel the intrigue, the old magic. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel the, the overwhelming miasma of the Seventh Avenue delicatessens that so often play a part. Um. <laughs> well, those are all the trappings that go on in that hot little room where one works, you know. I mean, they. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever did you ever have any feelings about Laurel and Hardy? I liked them very much at one time. I mean, I was an admirer naturally. Why? They mean a lot to you. Well, they were also a very early influence. I mean, if there was any influence, I, I learned that whenever I fell down. Uh, I used to fall down the stairs quite a lot when I was about eight or nine. I learned to fall down the stairs from Laurel and Hardy uh, with style and grace. And pick yourself up with a 
A rueful glance. Huh? A rueful glance. Uh, the, the, the hardy glance. Yes, the, oh. all of a hardy. But, and do something with your, 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 your tie. <laughs> yes, you know, flip it up a little flip bit. Flip it up, yeah. Straighten your lapels and walk away. Yeah. Glancing at my mother with disdain, as I did. Were you ever exposed to a really great man named Raymond Griffith? Mm, Does that mean you can, you know, he was a uh, comedian in silent pictures who did some absolutely wonderful things. And I'm surprised that nobody has thought of reviving him, reviving those pictures. Uh, well, what, what was he, a solo, a single? Uh... Yes, and he, he was a dandy. He worked in, uh, in an opera house and in full dress. And uh, did situation pictures cheaply. He did one called You'd Be Surprised once. Brother, you'd be surprised. Uh, which uh, I think that actually Robert Benchley wrote the subtitles for. Um, and uh, <laughs> he, uh, I think that began with the famous situation of the, of the, um, the uh, Crown Prince uh, with a bottle of champagne, uh, breaking it over the nose of this ship, which mm. extends the waves and slides mm. into the water and disappears. Sinks from sight. That's right, and he's a submarine. Hey, have you seen no. Yulo? Hmm? Have, have you, you seen Jacques Tati? I haven't seen the new one. I'm going this week and I'm looking forward to it. Have you? I saw the, uh, no, not the new one. In fact, we just talked about it earlier here tonight before you came in. Uh, oh, the, I thought that. Oh, the yellow law was uh, uh, beautiful. Little the holiday. I mean, yes, the of course. Uh, there was a, one, one thing. It was one of the few pictures that have actually caused me to, to do what they always <laughs> do in fiction, and that is laugh until my sides hurt. I found that phenomenon actually occurs. How many times did you see it? I saw it four times. Uh, and you can join the club. Sorry. Each time I saw it, I discovered things that we had done. Uh, I, I remember the one thing. You remember the opening where where the French train was approaching and that the uh, completely unintelligible PA system <laughs> made the sound like this. And then the crowd would run down and go over to the next, and then the train would come the other direction. They kept going back and forth, and there was one little touch. When the crowd, about the third time, ran down to catch the train, somebody left a shoe up on the platform. Oh, well. They never came up to get it. It was just a tiny shoe. <laughs> that, was, that was some really superb gag. Remember the uh, rubber tie that becomes covered with leaves? <laughs> At the French funeral? Comes a, yes, the... <laughs> a funeral book, uh, 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 I enjoyed his little car, that very early Peugeot. I found that picture quite moving, actually. It yes. was a sort of abortive love affair with the girl. It never comes to anything, it just sort of trails off. Well, also his relationship with the little old man who, and when their vacation was over and everybody was going, everybody sort of said, well, we're certainly glad to get away from this Lulo. Mm -hmm. uh, the little old man came down, and the only man, the only person he found any kinship with, was uh, you know, he came and says, "Come and see me." And gave him this card. That was a very touching moment. Beautiful little thing. The whole picture was the projection of, of really of one man and his skill and deafness. It, it, it was a pale You remember the very sad scene, one of the saddest scenes of all, and yet funny and kind of a. a it was sad and funny the way uh, true humor is. Mm -hmm was the uh, scene where they were having the costume party. You remember where everybody, uh, there was a big party supposed to be held, and uh, they came down in this little resort, and the only two people who showed up was Yulo in his, his pirate's costume and the girl in her costume. You remember that? And they were dancing. Lovely, yeah. It was a beautiful scene. He was trying to say, come on, let's have, we're having fun here. Having fun. And she kept thinking, oh, what am I doing here? And the little old man in the other room listening to the BBC. The BBC was saying, out in consideration of the economic situation of Thailand and the Middle East, that disaster was constantly yeah. being projected. <laughs> and the old Spaniard playing cards. Every time he'd play cards, the wind would blow his cards in his face. And, oh, he was, he's the master of the running gag. He really is. It just uh, seems to me so sad that we can't... We haven't anybody of that sort operating here, have we? Oh, no. I don't think the Americans are humorous people at all. Uh, we, uh, 
we just can't, like, for example, the other, last week I, I did a little thing, and it's very intriguing. Uh, uh, I, I played a recording of a man who has done some very funny things, and it was an interview with Dr. Sholem Stein, who is a, a phony folk music expert, who has this heavy kind of, uh, you know, the kind of people that you hear interviewed on the Barry Gray program. <laughs> a very official sort of people, you see, who have just written a book tracing the origins of folk music from the Middle East through to the Bahamas. And his book was called Bahama Mama. And he was, <laughs> and, and, and it was a very funny, uh, a very funny, uh, satire of expertise mm -hmm. where the man uses official religious references to cover up his phoniness, you see. And With footnotes? You know? the, the whole thing, he kept saying, of course, you'll, you realize in the uh, fifth book of the Mishnah, uh, there is reference made to a football-shaped world, which uh, is found in the uh, lyrics of um, one of the uh, tribal folk dances where they say, he's football-shaped woman, he's elephant jump, uh, sing <laughs> wonderful thing, and and uh, the, inter the interesting thing about it was that many people became irritated about this. Really? And yet here, this thing, this 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 satire was saying, let us not use real things, really uh, important things, to people to cover up phoniness. He was jibing away, and people uh, just don't understand this. And it's very sad when you see that humor is is as as humor as a tool has disappeared. Well, you know, uh, uh, last week I was speculating about the uh, the whole WC Field thing. Have you run into any people recently who keep going to see Fields of Pictures, like the bank deck and whatnot, and who know every single mm. inch of those pictures, the names of the actors, the gags they can, and who find supreme delight in, in at least recalling all this. I mean, uh, it seems to me that there are a lot of people who are conscious of the fact that we no longer have that type of thing in our movies uh, and in our, our lives, uh, but people who, who do get some sort of satisfaction out of keeping it uh, you know, keeping alive. It alive. Unfortunately, it's it's uh, it's kind of a nostalgic aliveness. It isn't a real aliveness. That's the trouble. No, I suppose not. And many of these people I speak of uh, are too young to have seen Field when he was operating as a professional. You know, I mean, they've seen mm -hmm. these pictures in Revival and whatnot. But at least it seems to me a healthy sign that there are people who, who know what is good. Well, this goes back to earlier when you said that you didn't think there was a market for uh, humor. I think there is a market, but I do think this, that uh, since all markets require some mode of production, like books, somebody has to print it, uh, somebody has to give you a microphone or has to give you film and so forth. We have, we, we, we have a committee world today. Oh, that I perfectly agree with. I, I really uh, think it's all right there. Um, but, of course, in written humor, which is what we started talking about, there are very few outlets left for the person who wants to write the sort of thing that uh, we were talking about. Uh, the New Yorker still remains uh, the one magazine where you can expect to see that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. True, there are a couple of other magazines, such as uh, Playboy and Esquire and so forth, but um, I don't think that the situation that we had in the 1920s exists any longer. Well, we had a really a uh, not a wealth that at least a half a dozen magazines to which young people might contribute and might uh, at least try out new kinds of things. Well, well, I have a feeling, though, that young people don't don't think in terms of humor. Now, you're assuming that young people uh, write these things, and it, it's not... But I just don't think they think in terms of humor any longer. I think we live in a world that is thing-oriented, and uh, a child who, say... Uh, was born in 1940. Uh, it's now uh, 1958, 18 years. He's uh, he, he he doesn't just know. He doesn't have the humor. and that's why I say that that when I was a kid, there were a lot of these things around. I mean, I just automatically picked up Benchley. Uh, I automatically picked up something like uh, Stephen Laycock. But now most of these books of these people are way back in the shelves, and, and that's the end of it. And today, uh, they, they pick up J.D. Salinger. 
Uh, they go from Salinger to, uh, Kerouac. To Kerouac. And th there's no humor. Uh, and incidentally, I, I have a feeling is that the intriguing thing about it is that most of these books that I've read of the, the recent, uh, the recent outpourings of passion writers, the, the Kerouacs and the John Holmes and so on, is that these books incessantly speak of love, but they're the most loveless books I've ever read. I quite agree with you. They're completely arid, I feel. I've tried to read them and, uh, I get the same. And, and they have this, this, this constant undercurrent of true hate. Hate for the people that don't understand love, is the way they say it. And of course, this, this negates the idea of what they're saying, which is universal love. Yes, they all seem to have, and this is true of the angry young men in England, a dog in the manger attitude, a resentment about some sort of deal that has been, uh, given them by life. And it has, in a way. I mean, they, they, uh, uh, most of them were either born during the Depression or post-Depression, and I suppose they have a le fairly legitimate beef, but you would think that there would be a few yeasayers, wouldn't you? Well, I was uh, I had a very peculiar experience happen to me along that line. There's a, you know the magazine Encounter, the British mm -hmm. magazine? Mm -hmm. Well, there was a an article that appeared in Encounter magazine in 1957, and they were talking about the angry young men. It was an article surveying the angry young men. And then they, they, they in, in passing, they said, in America, there is only one person that we know of who is, uh, in our opinion, working as an angry young man in America. And of all places, he's working on the radio. His name is Gene Shepherd. That's a profound compliment. I've been very pleased. <laughs> no, that's actually happened, and I don't, for heaven's sakes. And, and I'm not mad, you know. I'm just irritated. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I think that, that the American today is not capable of it. He's not capable of anger. He's only capable of vague irritation and an occasional chafing. And where yeah, it's rubbed that's... a little bit, you know, and he puts the ointment and the salve on and the little lanolin, which uh, makes it easier to go along with. And, you know, so I, but I was amazed to find this is in Britain, this guy. Yeah. And, uh, well, I don't know. It's, it's all very confusing. Yeah, I, I quite agree. The uh, the problem state is one of torpor, of kind of a fleecy, uh, <laughs> well. stupefied uh, passivity. Yes, uh, I agree with you, uh, I, I uh, speaking of passivity, it's uh, an intriguing thing. You you know, of course, of this big thing that happened in Los Angeles with the fallout. What? Uh, well, you know the big story. Did you did you hear all the news last week about the radiation levels rising to uh, what had been called dangerous heights before? You see? And all of a sudden, they were getting a re a, a, a reading of uh, let's say. Uh, uh, 4,000, I don't know what the reading was, but whatever it was, it was 200 points over what it should have been. Everybody should have died, see? So everybody got all excited, and they got in touch with Washington and so on, and, and one official was quoted as having saying, well, what's with this fallout? Tell them to close the windows. <laughs> <laughs> this is a profound understanding. Right, Jack, right. <laughs> and it was an actual quote. From, and, and everybody says, oh, yeah, and they close their windows. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, uh, you know, what are we laughing about? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. It's a pretty incredible world. Fantastic. Well, this is the uh, the sort of thing that uh, this is the stuff of which uh, our life is made, and I and I think that as a humorist, uh, do you ever have a feeling that that you want to tear into something like this? Or do you feel that this lies outside the province of your of your interests and your Well, no. I mean, I I, um, <clears throat> I like to work out on the uh, the concrete symbol uh, that say the you know the television commercials, the uh, the stupidities in advertising, all that. The sort symbols, of thing. the symbols of creeping meatballers, in which that's right. I mean, those. Uh, those are the things that have, that have brought us to this pretty past, this inundation of, uh, Amen. of, uh, nonsense, uh, heavily commercialized and uh, constructed just for that purpose. I, I really believe it to, uh, to render us, uh, to, to anesthetize us, shall I say, to things so completely that we will buy the product. 
Um, I don't mean to imply that advertising is the only thing that's wrong with it. A lot more than that is wrong with it. But, uh, and the particular kind of work I do, I have to use concrete symbols to work out on. Well, of course, uh, you take the symbol that is recognizable, that people understand, and, That's right. and then all of a sudden they begin to see the inanities in a lot of other areas that are connected with it. I, I, do you know that I have, uh, I, I'd like to say that I have a very definite favorite among all the works in your current collection, which is called the most of S.J. Perlman, and it's this one, No Starch in the Dodi, Sugal Clay, which just absolutely fractured me. Uh, when I read this thing, and it's it's one of my favorites, and up until this time, I I, um, I, I just wonder when you wrote this particular piece. Uh, I'm always interested in the mechanics of writing. I've, I've done some writing myself, and and the mechanics intrigue me. Uh, how uh, a piece? Just just take this one. Do you remember much about writing this piece? Uh, I think so. Yes. How long did you write about? How long did you work on it? Oh, I guess about three weeks or so. Do you work steadily at a piece? Uh, once I, once I, uh, get going on it, uh, they, um, uh, this is, do- incidentally, this is, excuse me, this is sure. WOR New York. I feel just hit midnight. And, uh, I'll be here until one o'clock. This is Gene Shepard, and we have with us this morning. I thought you would enjoy, uh, a conversation here with, uh, S.J. Perlman. He's uh, one of my favorite people. And before we go any further, I would like to point out that one of the people who pay for this is the Volvo Car Corporation. He imports a very fine... I noticed that you, at one time, were an imported car fan. Remember some of your pieces about the MG. You owned an MG. MG, was? yes. I have, a, I have an MG, which is pretty close to 10 years old at this moment. Is it TC? You see, that's yes, right. I know. I, 49. I, beautiful little machine. You still have yeah, it? I bought it out in Cyan, actually. Right hand uh, drive? That's right. Oh, you're mm-hmm. a classicist from the way, from the way back. Um, yeah, I get a lot of pleasure out of that. It runs like a watch. Well, this is uh, one of the things, if I might point out, that is built into almost every imported car. These cars are built to last. Uh, this is a car that does what it looks like it can do. Isn't that frightening? I've seen that, yes. I spent a couple of hours trying to puzzle that. I tried it backwards, too. Does it make any more sense backwards? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could just hear this thing playing 200 selections without stopping. <laughs> it, actually, what it should say is this is a car which it does. Huh? <laughs> that would be nice. Then there's another one that has an ad that says, um, this car makes history because it makes sense. Which is an intriguing twist, but to... <laughs> yes, that lies it right on the line. <laughs> but if you're looking for a car that moves and is a joy to own and does not depreciate in value nearly like most of the cars we own today, I'd suggest you consult your Volvo dealer. Take a piece, no starch in the building? Yes. I think you wanted a civil answer, <laughs> and you won't get it. <laughs> you wanted to know how I came to write this? Yes, this, this this one intrigues me. This is a magnificent example of Newton. Well, embedded in that, you will find an actual quote from the New York Times, um, which um, reads as follows. Um, this uh, appeared in a piece by Robert Trumbull, who was the former Indian correspondent of the New York Times. Uh, he was writing a piece about Nehru, and uh, he says, I quote, Nehru is accused of having a congenital distaste for Americans because of their all too frequent habit of bragging and of being patronizing when in unfamiliar surroundings. It is said that in the luxurious and gracious house of his father, the late pandit Motilal Nehru, who sent his laundry to Paris, the young Jawaharlal's British nurse used to make caustic remarks to the impressionable boy about the table manners of his father's American guests. Well, I uh, happened to be reading the New York Times magazine, and I was bowled over by the nonchalance of that phrase. 
the late Walter Wilde's Nehru, who sent his laundry to Paris. I mean, it <laughs> seems so extraordinary to me that somebody should send his laundry all the way from New Delhi to Paris that uh, <laughs> I began operating on the background, so to speak. And uh, this was worked into this series of letters between the French laundry man and uh, Nehru's father. About the doty. About the doty that he had sent to Paris to be laundered. Uh, the, the, it's so funny how some of these things um, will pop up. I think the New York Times is a source. It's the source on my program of more of the humor that I work in than any other single choice. Particularly the Bulldog edition. You notice that the magnificent. that out of town edition, uh, full of little facts. Oh, I've done pieces on the air about about this. the amount of frog spawn that would be necessary to cover Indiana, for example. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> now that surely must fascinate a uh, fascinate a man in New Jersey who's <laughs> sitting on a train, lurching into his job as a CPA in uh, in Dye Street in New York, wasn't it? Well, I, I think, uh, who was it? Wasn't it the John Dos Passos? As a matter of fact, there was a, a technique that the French, getting back to the data, is there was a technique of some of the French artists of uh, the mid-1920s, and that is taking significant bits and snips of newspapers and advertisements and all kinds of pictures and putting them together in a collage. That's right. Where you, where you got this tremendous impact and you got an insight into a whole area of life merely because of the slice that they had taken. And I think this is the New York Times. It's a collage of magnificent surrealism. <laughs> on, on one page, there'll be a little bitty item that'll say something like, we have just lost $18 billion out of the budget. And then there'll be 34, 34 columns about a jar that was discovered in the Middle East. Somebody dug it up and there's a picture of it. And there are all kinds of speculations about this early early civilization. And all the while, hanging over Broadway is an enormous picture of Ed Sullivan. I know. Looking down on us benignly, and it says, Tomorrow's Ed Sullivan Day. Are you going to rise to it? <laughs> it's it's such an infinite variety. Oh, you just can't. If you keep looking, you just can't help. I, I, stood, I stood on Broadway at about 45th Street the other day, and I'm looking up at this giant scripto sign. And there are these, these, these 45 foot long ballpoint pens standing up there over Times Square, and there's a big imitation airplane flying along there. Did you see this? And there's a waterfall and two horrendous figures all looking down on me. And I have this, this feeling of being part of an age which makes the hanging gardens of Babylon look like a geranium pot. I know. And the, probably the reason I didn't see that particular thing you described is that I was walking along, I believe, that same day and saw the past a uh, couple of men who were talking. And one was saying excitedly, excitedly to the other, the way I exist, from hand to day and from mouth to mouth. <laughs> well, I went along in a dream after I heard that phrase. <laughs> Isn't that a perfect description of the way one lives today? From hand to day and from mouth to mouth. <laughs> there's something ineffable. I mean, there's this, this tenuous thread, of the, the, the kind of the golden key that unlocks all of the civilization that sometimes pops out on, out of us without 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 even even the. This, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I'll never forget when I first came to New York. I was out of work for about a year. Have you ever been in a position in your life where you didn't earn anything for about a year? Jack, this is a description <laughs> of my working day. Go ahead. <laughs> so I'm standing in this papaya juice stand. And uh, at that time, I was existing on papaya juice. And uh, I'm standing down there in the papaya juice stand, and right in the heart of it, of the... Uh, of the of the coconut juice belt here, you know, right. and I'm down there and I'm eating and drinking the papaya juice, and there was this guy walked in, and uh, he was a coconut juice man, and I had been afraid of trying coconut juice because I, I heard that coconut juice did something very sneaky to your digestive system. <laughs> I was having enough troubles at that time anyway, but I'm not battling this. See, so so he walks in next to me, and it was a funniest. Funniest bed. This is an, uh, this is the kind of thing that well, all of a sudden you get a realization of what is happening to us, or at least to me. I'm drinking my papaya juice, and the guy comes in and he says, "I'll have a large coconut juice, please." And I'm standing next to him. I'm drinking my papaya juice, 
And then he turns to me and says, why don't you try coconut juice, Jack? I says, I'm a papaya juice man. <laughs> and then he says, oh. He went on drinking his coconut juice. And then I, I drank my papaya juice. And I'm walking down the street. And all of a sudden I said, why? Why am I a papaya juice man? The realization suddenly burst out. Yes, that he was right. Of course. And, and you know, it's it's a funny thing. You, you suddenly and did it change your life? Yes, I went back and I had three coconut juices, and it was right. The stuff does do that to your digestive system. <laughs> I found out it was right. It's really and if you, it's really not yeah. gentle, you know. And had you topped that off with about eight <laughs> eight ounces of halva, you would have found that you were really in business. <laughs> that <laughs> that kind of a diet is. This is, the wrong age. <laughs> this is the perpetual motion machine that you're talking <laughs> about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> but I, I, um, I find myself in, in that sta- the same reflective mood that you got into also, particularly when I stand over here, uh, or pause, I should say, in front of Taffinetti's, you know, and I watch these people. This gives you pause. It does, yes. And you see these people eating these Enormous Idaho baked potatoes. They're about over oh, 18 or 20 inches long, from which the potato has been scooped, refried, and then placed back in the shell of the potato. Now, I, I, don't you wonder about that sort of thing? I oh, mean, <laughs> infinitely, <laughs> infinitely. Like tonight. I'm I not. mean, what is the magic <laughs> involved, digestive wise, shall we say, in removing? The no, interior of the Yes, pancreas wise. <laughs> we are living in times that are parlous. Parlous, indeed. <laughs> I was walking along McDougal Street not more than three hours ago when I was confronted with the apparition of a new Japanese tea room that had just opened on McDougal Street directly opposite uh, Rienzi's, which is an Italian, neo Italian type coffee mm-hmm. shop. And I thought what a magnificent coup would be for some enterprising businessman to open the first American hot dog joint in the village, thereby bring some new atmosphere and blood to this strange world that is fermenting. I think you've got a a big $5 (laughs) idea there. (laughs) Oh, by George, you know, one thing um, you you do, you know, you, you can't focus, I... I was going along the other day, and I, I came in front. Have you ever been? Have you ever? Are you a fan of Sixth Avenue novelty shops? I am, and you mean those schlock stores? Up, yes. Up and down Sixth Avenue. Yes, with I, those magazines with the, the magazines and the novelties, the rubber Frankenstein masks, and the jokes, and the yeah. jokes, and and the little people, the little the little boys that are installed on on the ashtrays, yes, those and on, on the tops of bottles and all this sort of thing. And you look in there, and you see you see that this is a basic kind of, of, of uh, almost a basic kind of folk art. You stand there looking at the artificial mustaches, and you wonder what what an anthropologist of the year 5000 BC AD or so mm-hmm. is going to dig in the ruins, and he comes up with this a rubber Frankenstein mask, yes, uh, or a giant rubber foot with claws on it, and the uh, well, of course, he's going to write an extremely long of pieces. Uh, in which he relates this to, uh, to the uh, pre-atomic. Uh, well, well, look at this. Look at this. What do you make of this? Well, I read here in Letters of Fire, five-foot flat globe. Do you know what a grip <laughs> I, I'm, I'm tempted to add with the Floyd Floyd, but I don't see that. The, <laughs> now, what is that? Here's an ad. This is a typical ad that, that, that when you look at it, you say, well, how can this be? All of a sudden you look at it. But generally, I looked at this first and I said, yeah, well, of course. I know what a flat globe is. Of course not, because all six pieces are suitable for framing. What six pieces? Of this flat globe. Oh, it's in pieces, is it? Yes, and it's flat. You mean like poultry and pods? You're the first in your neighborhood to own a square beach ball. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, that same peculiar... <laughs> Who would, a globe, a globe. And then, uh, but then it says very carefully down at the bottom, only three orders to a customer. <laughs> you see, they don't want people. They don't want people to make piggies of themselves. <laughs> I'll never forget. I. <laughs> oh, these are parlous times. They are. You wouldn't believe some of the stuff that's coming through in the mail, really. Um, they. Uh, 
uh, kind reader sent me, for example, a uh, the advertisement of some outfit in New Jersey the other day, which showed three uh, uh, members of the Walking Dead standing around a sort of IBM machine. Mm. And uh, the virtue of this thing was uh, that the place that you were... Uh, uh, this was a real estate firm that was showing this thing. Uh, the idea was that instead of wasting a lot of time combing through folders with pictures of properties that you might want to buy... This IBM machine would uh, uh, snap out a punched card in you based upon your own likes and dislikes, you see, and immediately come up with the correct house. And I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but like, I don't like beaded screens. <laughs> <laughs> that's too bad. You've got to buy this house. And that's, that's I, can't, the end of it. I can't stand Byzantine architects. <laughs> Well, look at this. This will give you pause now. You notice the the, the tone of of, um, of uh, satisfaction. This is a clipping uh, which says computers vocabulary held Churchill's rival, and uh, apparently this is a computer at MIT which has a vocabulary larger than so Winston Churchill. Does this smoke cigars as well and, <laughs> and paint rather inferior pictures? <laughs> I could just see this machine when, when Britain is once again in the toils of the terrible national disaster, and this machine is put on the air. And raises that V-shaped... That V-shaped antenna that rises above it, you see. That's right. And uh, by the way, we live in the rabbit ears. Uh, we live in, in a rabbit ears world today with TV antennas. And I can just see it saying all we have to offer are electrons, grid bias, and... Basic view. Mm. Look at that thing. It's frightening. Good 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 and yet the presses of the New York Times, as you said before, are grinding out <laughs> more and more of this as we sit here. But it, I, what, what bothers me is that the, the, the sound of the, of the article is one of satisfaction. We have finally come up with something better than people. Yes. Well, of course, now though, I... They really will have to redesign everything in order to fit this kind of uh, of uh, computer. <laughs> I wonder how it's going to be on world history. Oh, it'll, I think we'll all get back eventually to McGuffey's third reader, don't you? I mean, they, it'll look at this one. Now. And what about Farmer Brown, who's busy subdividing his North Forty? Did you hear what? Uh, <laughs> Mail order muscle builder is girdling for about. With Uncle Sam on his ads. Now, this is by Earl Wilson, it says. It can't be <laughs> by Earl Wilson, can it? Not in the New York Post. <laughs> it is. Really? It certainly is. Is that Earl Wilson? Yes. Who is gripping Charles Atlas around the knees here? <laughs> oh, you wouldn't believe this if I showed it to you. <laughs> and yet it seems to be a legitimate portrait of you, <laughs> even with hair yet, as they say. <laughs> This is one of the funniest pieces I've gotten in years. It's a piece about Earl Wilson talking about Charles. Read some of the lines that Mr. Atlas <clears throat> said. You know, Charles Atlas, in seven days I can make you a... I was down there six or seven years ago, down where did he name uh, <laughs> Atlas, whose real name is Angelo Siciliano, went on. And I took off my clothes and showed him I was the man I thought I was. One of them said, quote, we all got fat bellies around here, unquote, <laughs> and that they would be my pupils. What's the matter with those fellows? There must be a clique in there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can see when it was printed. Look, this is a real collector's item. Yes, March the 3rd, 1939. Earl Wilson hadn't discovered bosoms yet. <laughs> this, is, this is really a gas. <laughs> yes, it is. So you, you you don't know you don't know where it stands. Um, I, I see. I, I these things these things come on now. This this is this will give you pause. Reds call Bill Haley U.S. secret weapon. There's an AP dispatch from Berlin. 